despite the human species' exponential technological advances over the past millennia, little or no progress has been made in the scientific understanding of consciousness. We are awake and aware of our surroundings, but is this phenomenon reserved to our corner of the universe, to each individual? Or is it linked and shared across all the cosmos, the result of quantum entanglement? Are we truly confined to written, gesticular and verbal communication? Or have we simply, yet slowly, lost the ability to communicate telepathically due to atrophy? And by we, I mean you and me. For there are some who still can. Their message? We are not alone. My name is Clifford Mahoudi. I'm a Zuni Pueblo Indian elder, and I am here to talk about some of the subjects that have been of interest lately, and primarily the extraterrestrials, and UFOs, paranormal activity. I come from the Zuni Indian tribe from New Mexico, and I have an extensive background in my teachings about the star people, the priesthood of the, the sky, and all the different uh, activities related by them or for them and with the humans on the planet. My awareness of this extraterrestrial started at a very young age. I was born into a medicine society called the Galaxy Society, also known as the Clown Society or the Tricksters or the medicine clown, which is prevalent among the American Indian tribes. And throughout my years of learning about my background, I was not only born into it, but I believe that my mission was to ac actually look at into some of the activities related to the star people with the, with the humans on the planet, and of course with Mother Earth overall. My scientific background is that I'm an engineer. I started science at a very young age. And throughout my career, I have worked in some of the most sophisticated governmental systems, not only in the government, but, but also in the private sector. The reason that I am very interested in the extraterrestrial phenomena is that our tribe has extensive knowledge of the connection with the star people. All our protocols of taking care of each other on the planet, of taking care of the planet, were transferred from the star people into the early human stages of the Zuni people and other pueblos like the Hopi the Pueblo people around Albuquerque and Santa Fe, New Mexico. And years later, I started to talk with the other Indian tribes. They also have the same knowledge about star people, of their connection with them. The only difference between, say, like the Hopi, the Pueblo, and all that is our language. And also later on, I also looked at the other Aboriginal tribes of the planet, whether they be in Africa, like the Dogans, or whether they be in Australia, like the Aborigines, and all throughout the planet. And they have the same concepts, the same meanings of what we are here on the planet for.
I've been a professional clairvoyant and medical intuitive, gosh, for 31 years? Yeah. My goodness. It's been a while. I've worked for um, three-letter agencies doing uh, both murder and missing person cases um, for all over the United States. And people called me because for reasons I don't quite understand, I had a real eye for picking up details that helped solve things and, and provided more input to investigators. It was September of 2013 and I'd been here about 10 days. It was real close to the fall equinox. We were watching America's Got Talent of all things and had our favorite performers that we were hoping would win. And so when our, perf our favorite performer did his, his bid on stage, I turned to Otter and said, wow, he was really good. I hope he wins tonight. And suddenly there was a strange male voice, very loud, very clear in my head that said, he was good. I hope he does win. And the voice, for reasons I didn't understand, was not in the room. The person, the presence was not in the room. I knew, I turned and I looked at the Sandia Mountain and the voice was coming from a single spot inside the mountain. Thank you all for coming here to this beautiful setting for one of the most amazing announcements I think the planet will hear. This is Anjali who's had direct experience with these beings. They've come to her, they've directed her to be here, and she's gonna deliver a statement from her experience and also see what else wants to be said today. So thanks so much for being here, Anjali. Hi, good afternoon. Um, many of you know me by Anjali because that's how I chose to come forward with the higher beings that I am here to disclose to you about today have called me since I have become aware of their presence. On January 21st, 2018, it was a Sunday, I was sitting in a coffee shop in Southern California. I met two amazing people whom I have always referred to as Wayne and Trisha. Wayne approached me and after some time, we had gotten into a very in-depth conversation about consciousness of all things. He had lymphoma. I had, who knew, didn't even know I had recovered from Guillain-Barre, and yet I wasn't recovered. We knew something was lurking within my own DNA without knowing exactly what it was. And he pointed it out immediately. He said it was this, it was here. It was all of the toxicity in the environments that I had been working in, and literally the energy that had been created around me that had made me ill. After some time, he and his wife, Trisha, invited me to their home because he had excavated a tunnel into the side of the mountain that is his property after he had met what he called aliens. He said he had seen them, he had seen their craft up in the sky above his mountain many nights and he had become obsessed with finding out more. And he said that he had gone on top of his mountain and that they had been there. And that they told him that they were inside, that they had a base. And from that moment on, he had one singular mission and that was to get inside that mountain. The 
American Indian people did not invent any of this type of uh, rituals or procedures like in the like on the religious side for example spirituality and religion are confused a lot of times ours is based on spirituality and religion like the other established religions are invented by man and not transferred or or uh, given to us by the ever or at least the extraterrestrial people so the star knowledge that we have is nothing that was made up. It's always been with us, all the protocols, <clears throat> whether it be in relationships with humans, whether it be in connection with Mother Nature, were passed on to us, or in this case, the present term used is downloaded. They were downloaded to us thousands of years ago. So we have always had that basic knowledge or that that information that has been incorporated into our DNA because the humans are actually hybrids of the space people based upon what I have studied. I've been an experiencer since I was three and a half to four. I remember being at my grandmother's house and waking up and watching a reptilian walk through the wall and leave. And it scared me to death. And I can still describe, I could draw it for you. But in 98, the experiences really ramped up when uh, I saw uh, what we call a skipper ship now, a small oval craft about the size of a small plane, happened to be hovering over a field of, owned by Iowa State University full of uh, cattle that they were doing genetics on. And I knew that because I have a degree <laughs> from Iowa State and worked in those areas. But I saw the UFO. It was very low. It was hovering. It was silent. And it looked like there was a hatch open on the bottom of it. And I thought, that's cool. I want to see that closer. And by the time I got closer, it had gone. And I thought, oh, well, that was interesting. I saw a UFO up close. Cool. So I contacted MUFON, I reported it. I thought nothing of it until 10 days later. I was asleep in my bed, and suddenly I went from deep asleep to very awake. But I, I, I froze, I didn't move, because there was someone in the room. And as I laid on the pillow, I could see the bedroom bathroom door, which was open, and silhouetted was a being whose head almost touched the ceiling. He was creamy white. He had a very large head. His eyes were very large, almond shape and dark. His limbs were very long and slender, and he had the longest fingers. And when he walked across the room, he took two strides to go about 10 feet. Hmm. And I went, oh. I watched him reach out like this and stroke my husband at the time's leg. And then I watched him reach out to try and touch me. And suddenly I sat straight up and I yelled at him. I said, what are you doing here? And he jumped and he had the most startled look on his face and he turned and he bolted through the wall. On Sunday, January 21st of 2018, I entered a tunnel that had been excavated by a man with four people, Wayne and Trisha, and another couple whom they're no longer in contact with. After a few minutes of walking, there was a light ahead of us, and we began walking a little bit quicker. And when we rounded the corner, there were two different races of beings that were standing there. There was a gray. I do not believe that he is organic in the way that we understand. 
also not a drone in the way that we understand. But a body that holds a consciousness that interacts. There were also several other beings that were what we typically now I understand call in this community tall whites. They were all well over six, approaching probably six and a half, maybe a little bit taller. Warm, not cool colored, a warmish white. But their skin, they're radiant. They took me into a room where I met several of the most amazing beings that are here. Suppose you came face to face with a being not of this world. What would you do? Who would you tell? I'm sleeping in the same bed, in the same bedroom, and uh, suddenly there's this tremendous pain in the bone of my calf. It was, I mean, it was bone pain, and I thought, oh, what's this? I thought I had a Charlie horse. There were four Zeta body type beings standing at the foot of my bed, surrounding me, and one of them had a device in his hand it almost looked syringe-like, and he was removing it from the area where I had had the pain. Then that's all I remember, and then suddenly I was put back to sleep. And between the tall, creamy white guy and the little gray guys um, that I now know were Ponte, I had insomnia for like two months. I could not get to sleep. I was afraid they'd come back. I was, uh, I didn't know what they wanted. I didn't know if they were gonna take me somewhere. I didn't know, but from then on, for almost three years, whenever it was going to be a kind, what I call now a UFO kind of night, my calf would start to itch and I developed a rash about yay big in the back of my calf about three hours before sunset and that night if I, my calf was itching and, and turned into a rash then I knew that I was going to have a UFO experience that night. Extraterrestrials are those beings that came to our solar system uh, perhaps millions of years ago because there's no time as the Indians would say you ask them when when did they come is it the the word that they use interpreted into English is since time immemorial, which means a long time ago, but we do not know exactly when. Nobody does. And all our prayers, all our rituals, all our ceremonies are based upon that concept. It's based upon long, long time ago. Now there's another concept that is also part of the extraterrestrial uh, information is the, the planet itself. The scientists have said or have theorized that the Earth has flipped on its axis at least 13 times, and which would probably go into billions of years. Now the American Indian, at least my tribe, the Zuni Indian tribe, has said that we have gone through three great f catastrophes. And we're now at the verge of the fourth catastrophe, which in this case will be wiped out by fire. The last, last one was by water. As we all know, there's a lot of references to it if you look at the Bible. 
They also talk about the great flood. There's other Aboriginal tribes that also talked about the flood time and also right after the flood was the Ice Age. And so there, is a, there are a lot of information that's out there. The only problem in the Zuni case is that we don't have a written language. But we do have a oral history which is repeated almost on a monthly basis, if not maybe in a daily basis when, when our grandfathers were still young people. But we do know, or at least my teachings, is that if you take these concepts in terms of time and our incidences and the history, we know that it parallels with the same information as in the, the scientists of other groups and also the, the timetables of many books that have been written about, for example, the Holy Bible. The Zetas that, that talked to us, the individual that first spoke to me, we didn't know his name for almost two months. Mm. And that first week when he was talking to us, I finally admitted to honor that I was hearing him. I said, you know, I hate to keep calling it the voice from the mountain. That sounds kind of dumb. I'm going to give it a nickname that comes from the Sandia Mountain. I'll call him Sandia. I completely forgot that Sandia in Spanish means watermelon. That's because on the top of the mountain there's stripes like on the rind of a watermelon. And he was listening. He said, Sandia, eh? Watermelon head, that'll work. That was his literal comment back to me. And I turned and I stared at that spot on the mountain and I went, who is this? But obviously had some kind of a quirky sense of humor. We finally got brave enough to ask him his real name in November of 13. And when I did it, uh, I said, Sandia, Sandia, I got a question for you. What's your real name and where's home? He said, home is the fifth planet orbiting the further of the two stars of the binary system you call Zeta Reticuli. We call our planet Pontel. We are the Ponti. And I said, what's your name? Dickum. I said, what? What? He said, Dickum. He said, slower. Dickum. Like louder was going to work. Right. And finally, I said, slower. Dickum. Come, I said, teal come. He said, that's close enough. In Sedona, we have what you call Bradshaw Ranch. And Bradshaw Ranch is a male and female vortex. Okay, so the Greek philosopher Plato postulated that there were 64 platonic solids around the world and that they were in the shape of triangles and that there was an earth grid and the lines of the grid are called ley lines and instead of them being tic-tac-toe you know what I'm saying up and down side to side they're in the shape of triangles and the lines of the triangles are either electric or magnetic and that's true all around the world and so where the electric lines and the magnetic lines cross you have electromagnetic energy and we are electromagnetic beings in that we think thoughts, which you can measure with an electroscope that create electrical impulses, okay? And then the water in our body is magnetic. So therefore, we are electromagnetic beings and it creates a toroidal field. So a field, it's like two donuts, one on top of another. From your crown to your root, from your root to your feet, from your heels to your backside, your backside back up to your crown again. And you could also call it your oracle field. Okay. And the vortexes, they're, uh, once again, they're either electric or magnetic. And where these electric and magnetic lines cross, you have electromagnetic energy. And also couple that with the fact that there is mineral rich mountain spring water that flows underneath Sedona in rivers and aquifers. And it's highly conductive. And then the Red rocks are full of quartz crystal. They're full of quartz crystal. So you know how you can have a small piece of quartz in a watch, and now the watch is powered by a piece of crystal. It's called what you call the piezoelectric effect. And the piezoelectric effect 
is that if you hit a crystal mechanically, it creates energy. Okay, so if a small crystal can power a watch, how much could a mountain full of crystal power? Before I talk about the message that they would like to speak to you today, I would like to talk about the formation of a team that will return to this tunnel and with me and the owners of this property, this team will enter the base of these higher beings with every kind of known equipment that a scientist could possibly get his hands on. Those are the scientists I'm looking for. Transparency and full disclosure and honesty is the only thing that I want here. And I am looking for those people who can help us all deliver that. Because the beings need us to be ready for contact. When you hear somebody who's telepathic, and that's their, if you can call it native language, way of communicating, you pick up other information along with the message that they're giving you. You pick up the side thoughts. And we knew that his side thoughts included others that looked like him, that he wasn't alone. But we waited for him to bring up anybody else. We weren't going to press him. We didn't yeah. ever want to press him for technology and give him the opinion that that was more important than learning about them as a people. Mm -hmm. We had a golden opportunity to understand their culture because he was free to chat with us. If you go back into the old, uh, the old, the pharaohs of Egypt, or if you come down here to places in Mesoamerica, Peru, and other places, you have these skulls that are elongated, and those were hybrids. And even to this day, there are hybrids walking in to the lives of, I mean, or at least the planet that are they're bringing good ways to take care of the people, but eventually they're gotten rid of because they're half alien and they're half humans. Now the present day hybrids are the, what we call the rainbow children. They have advanced knowledge. They can come, they're here right now. They've always been here. The previous groups were called way back in the fifties, they call them blue children and eventually turned into the indigos. And then now they, then they went into the crystal children. Those, in my opinion, based upon many, many studies, not only historical, but scientific and, and theological studies, is that these are the ones that are, even though they're uh, born of human mothers, they were put on this earth to lead us out, if you want to call it that, or to be leaders, but they've always categorized them as, as not part of the human society. Star nations have been exchanging seeds for millennia. That includes animal seeds, like eggs and sperm. So they, mm -hmm. they use the term blended because they feel it's more polite the Zeta body type nations have interbred with each other for millennia, and it's hard to distinguish some of them from each other. The Ponti have button noses. Some have no cartilage in their nose structure okay. at all, mm -hmm. and just two it's holes. Flat. Yeah. Um, they have in common nictitating lenses, retractable lenses, like some of the animals here on Earth have, like some fish and some birds and crocodiles. They have a nictitating lens. We have them too, but ours are vestigial in the corner of our eye. They have that special connection with the star people system. And uh, I'm, I'm still trying to write these things up before I go on to the next world about 
because if I wrote those back in the, when I met them, nobody would believe me. But I did meet those type of people. And when I asked for their guidance of, of certain things, uh, it doesn't really take very long for somebody to show up. With technologies like Neuralink, machine learning, and artificial intelligence evolving at an ever quickening pace, is it merely a matter of time before man cracks the ever elusive nature of consciousness? Or will the answer come from elsewhere, via a vision or message from outer space, inner space, or even the space in between? We have, we have gotten so much information from Teokum over the last eight years, it'll just drop your jaw. And when we um, had been talking to them a little bit more than a year and a half, one day we heard from Teokum and he said, we understand you have something called social media. Would it be permitted for us to open an account? And I sat back and went, Okay, I don't see why not. Um, as far as I know, there's nothing illegal about it. Right, right, right. And so we started translating their exact words as much as we possibly could. And Tilcom began sharing on Twitter along with the other two staff members he introduced us to three months prior to that, Drudy and uh, Rahaz or... Maynard. Yeah. His nickname is Radar. So, Drudy, Radar, and Tilcom all were sharing. Uh, a, a couple things that we want to ask. You don't ever want to tell them what to do, but you want to ask them. So, can you power up or vanish or change direction? Those are the first three things. And the CE5 basically means it's telepathy. So, you're, it means you made some kind of mental contact with them. So, when we're not telling them, but we're asking them, can you, I always say, can you, or please, I love you, can you please, can you power up or vanish or change direction? And when they do it, and it, it doesn't happen every single time, but it happens almost every single time. They have been with us from the beginning. They have been where we are. Everything goes through the same cycle of consciousness development and recognition of itself. They have been where we are. And they have been guardians of our process. When every form of consciousness coalesces back into the pure light. It remembers fully and begins to learn how to create its own creation. And therefore, it watches. It watches other expressions of creation learning because they only want to understand how to make their own. In 1971, the Ponte, along with a number of other star nations, signed a treaty. For, it was a 50-year treaty. And that treaty asked the star nations to not share technology with the general public, to not allow themselves to be photographed or videotaped. But the treaty didn't say anything about an experiencer like myself drawing what she experienced. Yeah. So Tilcom said, I would like you to begin drawing. And I hadn't drawn anything in 40 years. And That's the Ponte yeah. sent me an art teacher named Mim. And Mim has taught me over the past three, four years to go from very rudimentary to the drawings that you see now. 
I did not take any art classes to learn to do this. I learned my art from an extraterrestrial art teacher. I am not making this up. Despite our common makeup, mankind's brief history on our tiny spinning rock has shown we are incredibly diverse. Through this diversity, our species has seen stagnation and growth, poverty and wealth, peace and war. For, as with all things important to our survival, when the issues and interests reach a breaking point, the masses will enact change. I have had an opportunity to talk about the interpretation that the Hopi and the Zunis talk about in their prophecies, whether it be 9-11, whether it be uh, bringing in the terrorists from other parts of the world. These were talked about way long time ago. And, and if you look at the Hopi and the Zuni prophecies, they talk exactly about this thing. They, they also talk about the web that we have in the, in the uh, computer world. They also talk about the things that will be happening. They talk about famine. They talk about deviation from spirituality, going into organized religion. And so these are all part of our system that has been in existence for a number of years. And the source of that information is from what we call our, our star ancestors. North and South Pole are traveling faster than we've ever seen them travel into new places. And it's possible for us to develop two North Poles, one South, two Pole, South Pole, or two North Poles and two South Poles. Oh and then it weakens the magnetics and our influence uh, from this turbulent area becomes stronger and affects life on our world. Life on the surface can be affected by giant tsunamis, but also the cosmic rays become extremely dangerous yeah, for any plant and animal life. And the Ponte and other star nations took people underground for an extended period of time until we passed the turbulent zone and they brought us out when it was safe again. So that's in the history of not only um, the Zuni star nation, or Zuni uh, indigenous culture and their oral history, the Hopis, but if you go to um, other uh, places on earth, people were instructed to build a very large boat. You know the Noah story. Mm -hmm. In the Iroquois were instructed to build giant canoes at the same time. And so indigenous people it attempted to help them in order to get yeah. them to survive mm -hmm. whatever cataclysm happened in their geographic location. And the star nation that had jurisdiction over that area was the star nation helping. This cycle of learning is coming to an end because humanity's consciousness is evolving. The way that consciousness forms and creates matter, which is just energy manifest, something that they want to help us learn to do as we evolve. All consciousness begins and ends in the same place from what they call the source of all light. We are now at the 500th year of the introduction of what we call the white man. And we are also at the end of that span of they can only last so much. And the other group that is very fierce right now is what we call the dark force people. The dark force people are those rich people, the people that have 
Uh, in, in Zuni, they call them the witchcraft people that practice uh, benevolent systems upon their own people and even among themselves. So we're at that stage, and these are all the things that are put into the concepts of why we're going to go into that end of the world situation. It's not going to be an invasion from other sources, from other solar system, planets, or universe. It's going to be done by ourselves within, within our own communities. This is exactly what I learned when I was about 10 years old when one of the medicine men I heard when I was 10 years old is that I remember him saying in our own language, uh, interpreting and said that there is no white man or any other group will come into our, our village and destroy us because we are gonna, we're the ones that are gonna destroy us from our own homes and our own systems. And I still remember that quote since I was 10 years old. It was the Earth humans who requested the secrecy. It was mm -hmm. the Earth humans who requested the five decades to, in order to increase the awareness of the general public that star nations even existed. And they, haven't and they were not fiction at all. They were real, they were palpable beings. Mm -hmm. Many different cultures have visited this planet and the Ponte informed us that on any given day, somewhere between 75 and 80 separate cultures are visiting our world. 75% of those are in the ocean. Uh -huh. This is a water world. The star nations come because we have an abundance of water here. We take it for granted. Where you find a water planet, you find life and very diverse life. They explain something about the evolution and growth of consciousness through learning. And they used a word called density that I didn't, I didn't understand that. They were trying to wake me up. They were saying to me, the veil is very heavy. Wake up. In the first and second densities, consciousness is learning about its environment. It's learning that it exists in a whole, as part of one. When the consciousness matures for third density learning, it is placed in an environment that is conducive to a sensory learning experience. They say that this, the third density, is the density of choice. It is where we, we learn to remember who we are, where the seat of our consciousness has originated, and which path we want to go down to explore that. They say, that this is what we chose, each and every one of us, as a unique expression of the one source of creation, that each is an expression of that creation, which is also the creator. That we move through consciousness learning and coalesce at each stage. We bring what we have learned from each density into the next. And we begin to further coalesce as we return back to our purest form, which is light. These beings can travel on light because they are the light. It was by coincidence that I just found myself 
back getting back into this topic at a really interesting time in ufology when like of course the new york times article had been out for a couple of years um, they had just announced the um, existence of the uap task force and everyone was awaiting their report um, it was and so there were a lot of people who were joining ufo twitter at the same time i was so it was just a very exciting time to be rediscovering this topic <laughs> I definitely think that there were interesting aspects of the report, like the fact that aside from maybe one of them, they weren't able to explain almost all of these sightings. Um, and like you said, the fact that we that the report said like this, we don't think this is our tech, this isn't foreign tech, um, we don't think there's a natural explanation for it. So, um, but I understand why people were underwhelmed because like this report dropped while I was at work and I took a break and I read it in 15 minutes. It was like six to eight pages, I think. And for a government report, that's almost unheard of. There was also a fairly, a really interesting report about UAPs that came out of France, I think a couple of weeks after the UAPTF report. So um, yeah, I think that there is a lot of interesting information coming out about this topic and not just in the US, even though that tends to be where a lot of the focus is in a lot of these on online spaces. My instinct is that they can't all have the same explanation. Like I feel like there may be some that are some sort of natural phenomenon that we just can't identify because the video is not good enough or the readings aren't good enough or some of it is probably um, just errors in the data collection even though i think that everything that was in this report uh, was captured on multiple sensors like radar video um, and i mean maybe some of it isn't from earth like who knows <laughs> no star people or no spaceship gonna land and and take us away from what we had created that they're only observing it's because they gave us what we call the, uh, <clears throat> the our free will. We're the ones that have to decide. They're not gonna come over here and interfere because those concepts were already put in place in the beginning. We can ask for guidance, but we have to do it from e individually as a group and so on. We learned from the Ponte that when they come to visit anyone in their homes, they have a protocol they have to follow. And their protocol is cause no fear, do no harm, leave no trace. And they have the ability to put you to sleep. They have the ability to pick a memory from your ex life experience and portray themselves as not say a Zeta body type, but maybe an old friend from high school or um, an animal that you're not afraid of, like a four foot tall bunny rabbit. Mm -hmm. So the screen memories uh, are, are, are something that we deal with a lot. Yeah. And now that we understand that part of the reason they do that is they don't want you to freak out. So what we have now here on earth is we have two things that are occurring simultaneously. We have natural cyclical changes of this earth as it moves into its own density and becomes a fourth density environment. It will no longer be compatible for third density experience, which is what they say these human biotechnology bodies give us here. We have been through this cycle long enough and it's time for the next stage. We asked uh, Tilcom about languages and, he's, and how common telepathy was as a means of communication in the galaxy. And he said, well, gestural languages come first. Telepathic languages are the next most popular. O verbal languages follow that. And then visual languages or light languages, like you see 
fish in the deep ocean that can light themselves up? Mm -hmm. okay. All right, that's a, that's a light pulsing. language and mm -hmm. pulsing. Um, deep space individuals also have light languages. Mm -hmm. The poor people in this country are without any any shelter. They can take care of themselves, but we're feeding our enemies. This is the prophecies that the grandfathers told me, and we won. We will go into a famine. So these are the things that I'm watching. It. I was hoping that they were wrong, but they were not. So these are. This is the reason why I haven't quit talking yet because. As long as you're the lone voice in the wilderness, hopefully somebody will come and help you. The beings that I am in contact with refer to themselves as the council. Um, they are guardians over this world because they were asked to be, and they are fulfilling their duty, allowing us our free will to explore and to learn without remembering who we are so that we can return, recognize ourselves, and experience the full breadth of consciousness again and again and again. The problem is, is that this is a polarity situation where, boy, we have really, really forgotten what we're doing here, guys. And we're destroying ourselves and our world and we're trying to go out beyond our own borders into space as if we are ready to be space-faring species lovingly contacting other worlds. There are friendly extraterrestrial nations visiting our world, have been visiting our world for millennia, who are here to help us through the earth changes that we see beginning now. We may have our world being in what I generally call a mel of a hess. And we're heading for a very turbulent area of the galaxy. The star nations are very aware of what it can do to our entire solar system. Mm -hmm. And they're lining up outside of Neptune's orbit with hospital ships to help. They've come to help. They're not negative, they're not gonna eat you. They might tease you. They might blow a raspberry in your ear or call your name, but they're not gonna hurt you. And if you choose to learn how to interact with them, they're cultural explorers. They love learning about your life. Mm -hmm. What do you make? What do you cook? What do you do in your spare time? What do you love? That's your culture, and that's what they want to learn. They're cultural explorers, and they want to save the best of that so that if we do end up in a Mel of a Hess, that our culture still survives. You must recognize that we are all connected and that needs to frame every decision and every intention that you set in your life. Consciousness is much more complicated than we think it is. They want us to grow. They want as many of us as possible to be ready for the next step. And to be ready to accept them without fear, without threat of violence, but hand in hand. is both homogenous and isotropic. Simply put, if you peer in any direction far enough, it all looks the same. Could this shared uniformity lend credence to shared consciousness? If we are all but stardust, do we share a quantum link stemming back to the creation of the universe?
This is a physical disclosure and it is a consciousness disclosure. And what I mean by that is that these beings do not speak language. They do not use words like we do. Their mouths do not move and they make sound and begin to speak to us. Everything they do is what's called conscious communication. I want to differentiate that from the misunderstanding that this is telepathy. This is not telepathy. I don't know what that is. I don't do that. I, don't, I, I think that might be what I'm trying to talk about without um, not setting intentions, not being super clear, because conscious communication is so clear. It comes with everything. It's like um, a, a download, okay? We can, all, we can all understand that. Like an image, you get an image in your mind, and it comes encrypted with all kinds of information that immediately just downloads into your brain. And it, and it includes intention. So you know, you know. And it includes emotion. I have experienced nothing but love, compassion, kindness, patience, sometimes humor, very, very kind and gentle beings. It is a fuller, richer, more accurate, more highly evolved form of communicating. And guess what, folks? It works with all of the higher beings. It works with all of them. I can tell you right now what Otter and I have learned, about 10% of it has gone out to the public on Twitter. 90% of it has, has not. And uh, not that we're trying to hide anything. It's just that there's so much. Yeah. And the download she describes, we have experienced. You wake up feeling Day like your brain day. is jello. Mm -hmm. I mean, you become exhausted. Mm -hmm. You wake up exhausted, your brain feels like you've learned an encyclopedia of information within hours. Mm -hmm. A whole new language overnight. And yet, because it was given to you in an alpha, theta, or delta dream state, trying to remember it when you come back to waking consciousness, it's hard because yeah. it's like trying to remember your dreams. Mm -hmm. Some people remember their dreams much easier than others, especially if it's the very last dream of the night. But others get a download and feel like somebody's filled up their brain like you fill up a hard drive, okay. but they don't know what's on it. Hmm. And it surfaces slowly but steadily over time, naturally. It surfaces mm -hmm. more if you re-enter that same state of consciousness, uh -huh. that meditative state, right. that yeah. alpha theta state you can retrieve those memories much easier than in normal waking consciousness state. We have forgotten that we created this and that this is our very own experiment for learning. We have forgotten that we are all from the same consciousness. The veil is so thick and so heavy, we believe that we are singular individuals and that when we do this thing that we call die, that is the end. Or perhaps we just go to a heaven or a nirvana. Well, heaven and nirvana is return to the pure source. That's pure light, pure consciousness. And you are always on the path to that, always. But in order for the next world to come in a peaceful, the way it's supposed to be, there has to be a clearing. There has to be a, a uh, we have to go through that time of cleansing. The people has been asleep for a long time, especially this country. And I can honestly tell you, this started about the time when Kennedy, President John F. Kennedy was assassinated. So that's way back in 1963 when they started this whole 
whole effort and I have been very observant and I have studied these things from, the, from many different angles, the scientific, the historical, and the references that are made in many scriptures, religious scriptures. Bible, Job 4:15 to 18. A spirit glided past my face, and the hair on my body stood on end. It stopped, but I could not tell what it was. A form stood before my eyes, and I heard a hushed voice. Can a mortal be more righteous than God? Can even a strong man be more pure than his maker? I realize that there are things that we don't understand and that there may be explanations for phenomena that right now seem ridiculous, but sometime in the future we may have a better understanding. And also, like, this is a topic that for many people it isn't just curiosity and investigation, it's something very spiritual to them. Quran 2.31 And he taught Adam the names, all of them. Then he showed them to the angels and said, Inform me of the names of these, if you are truthful. I would, I would recommend that you pray or you meditate. Whatever you want to call it, do it with an open, kind heart. Ask for acceptance of our oneness and our connection to one another. Seek to better understand your own existence. Seek to elevate your conscious connection to all other expressions of life and the Creator here. And then, whatever your spiritual philosophy, you already got it. You got it. Like some people that I've talked to aren't really invested in whether there is scientific evidence or whether like this is real in a physical sense because to them it is more spiritual or religious and it what matters to them more is sort of how it guides their life and how they feel about it rather than what science discovers and like and you don't and you can't really argue with that like everyone has their own religious and spiritual beliefs if you have a friend in a town next door and suddenly a tornado comes and levels that town and they have a disaster and their community is in trouble and you know it. Where's the first place you go? You go to your friend's house, don't you? Okay, you go to the people you know and you help them first because you care about them. Mm -hmm. The Ponte are no different. If you make friends with the Ponte, if you make friends with any of the, the uh, helpful star nations, and there are a plethora of them, mm -hmm. then your chances of being assisted by them, they'll come to you to talk because you've talked to them before. Mm -hmm. It's no different. So there are benefits to having friends in high places. There's a whole fleet of them. This morning, a report that the government cannot explain those mysterious objects caught on video by the military. So what you've seen is what those Navy pilots saw in 2004, and there have been some 300 sightings since then. And I've talked to those pilots, and they know they saw something, and their radars locked onto it. And, and then all of a sudden, it was here on the surface, and then it's there. Uh, and they don't know what it is, and we don't know what it is. We hope it's not an adversary here on Earth that has that kind of technology, uh, but it's something. And, uh, and so this is a mission that we're constantly looking. What, who is out there? Who are we? How did we get here? How did we become as we are? 
How did we develop? How did we civilize? And are those same conditions out there in a universe that has billions of other suns in billions of other galaxies? It's so large, I can't conceive it. My personal opinion is that the universe is so big, and now there are even theories that there might be other universes. And if that's the case, who am I to say that planet Earth is the only location of a life form that is civilized and organized like ours? with mainstream media coverage and confirmed UFO leaks acknowledged by the US government rising steadily. Is humanity finally ready for conscious contact, full disclosure?